from MTN, the Montana Television Network. This is Face the State. Good morning. Welcome to Face the State. I'm David Parker, MTN political analyst. This past January, the New York Times reported that drug overdoses among young white adults aged 25 to 34 are a key driver in increased mortality rates. This is the first generation of young white men since Vietnam to have a higher death rate in early adulthood than the generation before it. And Montana is not immune. We have a problem, especially in our rural areas and on our reservations. And to discuss what can be done about Montana's drug problem, I brought together two folks who know a lot about substance abuse. First, Montana's Chief Justice Mike McGrath, who has witnessed firsthand the consequence of opioid addiction and meth in our criminal justice system. Second, Monica Skewis, an assistant professor of psychology at Montana State University, an expert on substance abuse and treatment, and the principal investigator for the Fort Peck Substance Abuse and Resilience Project. Dr. Skewis, Mr. Chief Justice, welcome to Face the State. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, so let's talk about this issue that the New York Times brings up. And of course, the New York Times article focuses on op opioid addiction, but of course, we have meth problems in here. Um, Mr. Chief Justice, where, where in Montana are we seeing the greatest problem with meth addiction and opioid abuse? Well, it's universal, frankly. It's everywhere. I mean, there are some areas that might have higher numbers than others, but it's throughout our state, rural, urban areas, both. Uh, recently, you may have seen there was a story from the Montana State Crime Lab that they're now seeing a substantially in increased number of uh, driving while intoxicated cases where they do the toxicology at the lab and they're finding meth. And that's uh, fairly widespread. Different parts of the state don't seem to matter. So it's a Montana problem. And Dr. Skews, would you agree with that? Absolutely. It's so, all over the nation and all over Montana. So it's not just a rural problem, it's just an urban problem, it's you know, everywhere. Absolutely. So you study addiction. I do. You do research on it. Mm -hmm. What is the root cause of addiction? What, what causes someone to get addicted to something? You know, people like to think that it's the drug itself, that there's some magical property of the drug itself. But, you know, gambling is an addictive behavior and people wouldn't look at a deck of cards and say, you know, it's those cards that's addictive. And I'm not saying that different drugs don't have different addiction potential, but I would really say that the root cause is in you know, pain and trauma and depression and untreated mental illness and poverty and things like that. So, but are we having an epidemic of gambling addiction uh, here in Montana? But it's a, it, it, there's a drug addiction problem. So driving down deeper, why is that an issue nationwide? Why is it an issue? Because it, um, you know, opioids, they kill pain physically. They work, they work really well. And they don't just address physical pain, but they also numb emotional pain. Um, and the same physiological mechanisms that address physical pain also solve emotional pain problems. So when people take you know, opioid drugs for physical pain, um, they find, wow, my post-traumatic stress symptoms also feel better. My depression feels better when I'm taking these medications. And sometimes they don't expect that, but it might be the first relief they've ever felt. So if you go to these root causes, it seems to be stresses associated with some physical pain, some mental health illness um, that are not being addressed. So let's go down there. Why are we having an epidemic of people that are having, struggling mental, with mental illness? And then why are we having a, an epidemic of people struggling with pain? Sure. Um, well, in terms of the, there's not a lot of great treatment resources for mental health you know, right now, especially in our rural areas in Montana. Um, when I work on the reservation, there's long waiting lists. Um, it's pretty hard to get in to see uh, a healthcare provider and the healthcare that you might get for mental health care might not be culturally appropriate, might not, it might be expensive. Um, you know, there's a lot of barriers to getting good mental health care and to addressing these issues. The other thing is just some kind of social isolation that people are facing in that there's not necessarily in, uh, not all people have a social support community that they can rely on for help when they need it. People are trying to go it alone and trying to solve their own problems on their own and um, feeling isolated, feeling lonely, things like that. 
Now, Mr. Chief Justice, you're seeing, uh, if I understand, an increase of this of caseload coming out of um, drug-related problems throughout the court system. Is that right? Absolutely, and it, and the numbers are fairly dramatic. Let me let me just focus on child abuse and neglect cases. Uh, because our experience has been the vast majority of those cases, particularly the ones that get to our level at the Supreme Court, involve uh, chemical dependency issues and, frankly, meth addiction is almost universally the, the factor that goes through all of these cases. So, in 2009, statewide there were 1,006 uh, dependent neglect cases filed, cases where the government is coming in and saying you're abusing or neglecting your kids. Uh, that you know, in f last year went to 2,321. So you're looking at more than double the number of cases that were filed in that period of time. In some communities, uh, Cascade County for example, the number has tripled. It doesn't seem to matter if it's a rural county or, a, or an urban county for example in Phillips County. Uh, very uh, rural county, the number doubled there as well. So the, the case numbers are going up dramatically. Child Protective Service workers case loads have increased over that period of time 75 percent. There are now 3,200, in fact more than that, 3,200 kids in foster care. Uh, in the court system we have a court appointed special advocate system. They're primarily volunteers that help out as an advocate for a child in an abuse and neglect case. Their caseload has gone up just in the last year 28 percent. So we are seeing a phenomenal increase in the number of kids who are being neglected and abused because of their parents addiction uh, to, to chemical dependency issues, but I must say it is almost universally addictions to meth. What's the cost of that to the criminal justice system and the welfare system and frankly to the society in general? Well, it's, it's dramatic, I mean, if you think about it, because it affects, well, for example, our, our caseloads in the court system have gone up uh, substantially and we are asking the legislature next time for five new judges statewide based on our case numbers we could ask for 22 new judges I mean our workload study indicates we need that many judges so that's just the tip of the iceberg you're talking about child protective workers they are seriously seriously under uh, staffed in that area in the de Department of Corrections they now have pending 750 pre-trial investigation, not pre-trial investigation, but pre-sentence investigation reports. That's a huge number. Uh, their probation officers spend more time writing those reports than they do supervising people on their caseload. All of it, the jails are, are swollen. There are several communities looking for uh, mill levy increases to expand their jail. We've got a crowding in the prison. Uh, you know, this many kids in foster care, that's an expense. So it's a, it's a broad, broad cost to society. Dr. Skewis, let's go, let's take what the Chief Justice is talking about and the cost of addiction and addiction that happens in parents. You know, parents are addicted to substances. What happens to the children uh, coming out of that process in terms of what I mean is, are they more likely to be addicted? What, what's the cost to them? Absolutely, they are definitely more likely to be addicted and whether that's through a biological mechanism, you know, ge genetic heritability, vulnerability um, plays a small role in that, but I think the majority of it is through the environment. I mean, you, if you have parents that aren't paying attention to their kids, that childhood abuse and neglect is one of those significant adverse childhood experiences that is a strong predictor of addictive behaviors later in life. It's that pain that people are trying to self-medicate later in life is being neglected when they're kids. So you said there's a genetic component to this addiction. To happens. addiction in general. To, okay, but, how, but, but you said it's a small part of the factors yeah. that can cause these problems. Mm -hmm. The other problems are seeing it, witnessing it, what else? Um, 
having these adverse childhood experiences. There was a really groundbreaking study that took place uh, by some researchers that really just measured the number of adverse childhood experiences that somebody might experience early in life, including having a parent that was incarcerated, uh, child abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, neglect, um, even a divorce in the family, having a parent with a mental illness, a number of factors and followed people up over time and found that the more of these things they had when they were kids, the, there was a direct linear relationship between causes of early mortality from all kinds of causes, including diabetes, cancer, heart disease, and addiction, smoking, drinking, accidents, injuries, on and on. But it was a very strong predictor of injection drug use, of um, alcoholism, of all sorts of things. Let's pull up that graphic from the New York Times uh, of the United States that basically shows the growth in opioid addiction and drug abuse throughout the United States. And of course, the red areas is where we're seeing this dramatic growth. And you kind of look here, you see this swath, right, basically from New England all the way down to the southwest, but also up, in, up here in certain counties here in Montana. What's interesting is that this is the growth that we're seeing, right? But you said, Mr. Chief Justice, and this is the tip of the iceberg, so if we could like extrapolate out, if you're already seeing increased caseloads, and if Dr. Skewis is correct that we have children that are, are seeing an increase in this, uh, with parents that are addicted, it is a tip of the iceberg that there's a lot more below there that could inundate the criminal justice system moving forward. There's certainly potential for that. I mean, that's the trend now, the last, uh, well, since 09, so you know, the last eight years. Uh, here's an interesting factor, though. Uh, youth courts are uh, within the uh, judicial branch in Montana. Our youth court numbers are not tracking the same as the numbers for young adults. Part of it is the Montana Meth Project is still involved. Uh, they target young people, young adults, and the idea is to at least so that uh, young people will understand there's a risk to using these drugs and prescription drugs, the kinds of things. And so uh, our youth court numbers are stable and steady, but once you get into the young adult area, that's when we're seeing the, the dramatic impacts uh, throughout our social services system. One of the things that the New York Times you know, paid attention to is that this uh, white Americans, 25 to 34, mm -hmm. why is it that group of Americans are particularly susceptible to these, these particular addictive behaviors and using these, these substances? What is it about that group that we're seeing? Well, it's developmentally normal when you're an adolescent, a young adult, to try new things and to experiment with your environment. And the prefrontal cortex is not completely developed until 25 or 30, meaning that um, executive functioning and the ability to make rational, um, you know, pre-planned decisions isn't completely there until adulthood, which is an, an evolutionary advantage. I mean, this is a good thing that helps you know, it helps people kind of explore their environment and, and try new things. Um, most addiction begins with experimentation and begins in the teen years. Mm -hmm. I think people are getting treatment in young adulthood because that's, you know, people can use substances for a number of years before the negative consequences start rolling in and before the addiction actually happens. So it could just be use and then it transitions into abuse and then dependence, and then the problems start happening. So people don't usually get treatment until they start having the problems, like their lives start falling apart. That usually takes a little while, so that's why the treatment happens in you know, young adulthood. It's almost unheard of for people to start becoming addicted to something after 30. It just it happens very, very rarely, um, and a lot of that has to do with brain development. But we're seeing improving uh, metrics, for example, among African Americans, among minority communities in terms of health, but yet among white Americans, we see this, this ma massive crisis. Um, is, is, it, is there a relationship between abuse and use of substance and the type of jobs that you have? I mean, what, what's, kind of, what, what's kind of the relationship between occupational stresses and uh, addictive behavior? So I'm not totally sure about that, but what I believe might be a contributing factor is beliefs about prescription medications being safer than street drugs. And prescription medications are chemically identical to street drugs. So, 
you know, Oxycontin and opioid drugs that you get from the doctor are not really different from heroin you get on the street. And Adderall is not different from amphetamines. So getting it from the doctor might feel safer and it might feel um, like not the same thing. It might be socially acceptable in certain groups. And so I think it's like social influences on that kind of behavior in certain groups where people use the substances that are available to them. And they use the substances that exist in their neighborhoods, and they use the substances that their friends use. So if it becomes acceptable in a certain you know, subculture or group of people, then it's going to spread. And I think that's what's happened. One of the, one of the things that was uh, done recently uh, to kind of shed light on some of this problem, not just in Montana, but elsewhere, is uh, in East Liverpool, Ohio, there was uh, the police found a, a basically a car with the parents who were strung out in the front seat of the car and they had the four-year-old child in the back seat and they took a photo and they put up on their Facebook page. And I wanna know from your perspective, Mr. Chief Justice, is that an appropriate thing for the police to do to bring light to this particular problem in your, in your view? Well, it, yeah, I think it probably is. I mean, it is what's happening. It, it, it certainly reflects uh, you know, that kind of a situation is not unusual. We've had cases similar to that. We had one last year where a highway patrol uh, come up on a car on Interstate 90 that's pulled off to the side of the road, engines running, uh, cars in gear, parents are passed out in the front seat and they got three kids in the back seat. I mean, it's almost an identical situation. Uh, that's not unusual. That is what's going on, I think, to the extent that uh, people need to understand what's happening in their communities or in their states. It was a good thing to do. Dr. Skewis, what do you think about that um, activity by the police in East Liverpool, Ohio? Yeah, I, you know, I understand it because I think the police are frustrated. A lot of people are frustrated because they just don't know what to do and it just feels like efforts aren't succeeding quickly enough. Um, I don't think it was probably the best choice largely because I view addiction as a, as a mental health disorder. And I'm trying to imagine an equivalent response to another disorder like schizophrenia and police maybe taking a picture of someone homeless talking to themselves on the street. And um, would that actually help? Would that actually be effective? Um, I see the point of raising awareness and I get working from a place of frustration. Um, and I absolutely don't think what those people were doing was acceptable in any kind of way. But I think the research shows that taking a more compassionate approach actually is more effective in the long run. So one of the things that you said is that uh, part of the issue is, of course, people get a prescription from mm -hmm. a doctor to deal with the, something that's wrong, you know, yeah. pain. And that, that drug is essentially equivalent to what you get on the street. Mm -hmm. So let's go back. Is, is this opioid addiction nationally related to the fact that doctors are overprescribing these medications? Um, it's related to prescription practices, um, and it's definitely related to marketing of OxyContin. It's essentially related to when OxyContin came on the market in 1996. This is definitely related to it. Whether doctors are overprescribing or not is, depends on the population. There's some research that shows that doctors underprescribe to ethnic minority people and to certain elderly groups and overprescribed to other groups. Um, there's factors that doctors should consider in, and there's a great um, Center for Disease Control and Prevention guideline for physicians on how to prescribe and what to consider in prescribing. So doctors, I think, do need more information about prescribing guidelines. One thing I will say is that most people who are given opioids for pain, chronic pain or acute pain, do not become addicted to it. I mean, this is the minority. This is the exception rather than the rule. It's, um, there's a danger of being overly afraid of taking these medications after you know a surgery or something like that. Um, but it is a risk. I mean, if people are younger or if they're depressed, they're at increased risk of developing a dependence. Or if they have had a substance use problem for a, another substance, and doctors should screen for those things when they prescribe. So I wouldn't say doctors should prescribe less, but they should ask some questions before they prescribe. Are there other, other alternatives? I mean, so for example, on our ballot, we have uh, an initiative to have medical marijuana. Is that an acceptable 
alternative to opioids? You know, medical marijuana works for some people in some kind of pain, in some kinds of pain, it's effective. But what's been really shown to be effective that's vastly underused is cognitive behavioral therapy and mindfulness-based stress reduction. These are two types of treatment that work as well as opiates for chronic pain, particularly back pain. And people either don't know about it or don't know how to provide it or um, are reluctant to prescribe it because this type of treatment is as effective as opiate treatment and um, it requires talk therapy and it requires working with your thoughts and some homework exercises, but it's quite effective at managing chronic pain. Mr. Chief Justice, how do we fix it? All right, from, a, from your perspective on sitting on the bench, what's the best thing that we can do to address this issue from a criminal justice and welfare perspective? Well, I think the, the single most effective thing that we've seen that actually works is the creation of drug courts. And uh, in Montana at this point, uh, in terms of the state government, uh, we have, I think, 27 And you were uh, an early courts. advocate for this, right? Absolutely. And, 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 and you pushed for it when you were AG, right? It continue to push for it, um, it because we see results. And we see uh, positive results um, as opposed to the alternative, which is often incarceration. So drug courts are... Uh, a way of, of uh, imposing intensive supervision on somebody that's in the process. There, there are really high expectations of a person that's in the process. There are consequences. Uh, you get the, the whole system gets involved. You get a social worker or probation officer, uh, the, the prosecutor's office, the defend, defendant's uh, attorney, uh, perhaps other representatives for the defendant. You also get the judge involved. So they, they set, and, and it's a fairly long process, 18 months is about an average mm -hmm. uh, uh, run for, for people in that system, but it's proven to be very effective. Uh, um, I'm a strong advocate for drug courts throughout our state. We've, we've established a lot of them, and they work. They work in not only in the criminal arena, but I was talking about child abuse and neglect cases. It's effective in those cases, too. People that truly want to have their kids back uh, are, are oftentimes very motivated to work in the drug court process, and it's been successful. And the research evidence absolutely backs it up. I mean, all of the studies that I've read about drug courts have incredibly positive outcomes. In my understanding, of course, well, let's just let's talk some nuts and bolts about this, right? Uh, it is cheaper to put someone through the drug court option to, to incarcerate them, right? Oh, no question about it. Well, mean, how much, you're how you're much talking about, well, you're talking about the uh, cost of incarceration. Uh, when I was attorney general, it was about $25,000 a year. It's probably higher than that now for an individual. You can run a drug court for a lot less than that. And then if you look at the cost of getting the children to stay oh, with the yeah, parents, exactly, then it Exactly, exactly. I mean, if you, you, again, back to the costs of foster care, uh, you know, finding adoptive parents if, if the, term, the parental rights are terminated, the cost for treatment uh, for those children often is mm -hmm. very high. A lot of these kids have been pretty uh, severely damaged by their experiences. So is it better than to have children be reunited with their actual parents, um, even though they've been, you know, addictive and they, 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 they were uh, problems before. So is it actually better for the children to actually then be raised by the natural parents than going into the foster care system? I think it depends on the type of environment at home. But if parents could, you know, if it's not, a, if abuse isn't happening, if a kid is not in danger, absolutely. It's so hard for children to be removed from their parents. Um, it's one of the most traumatic things that kids go through and it's a huge predictor of later mental health and substance use problems later in life. If you have someone that's incarcerated, so what are the penalties? So uh, I'm, I have, a, let's say, a meth possession or something like that. I go into the, the system and I don't go to the drug court. What's going to happen to me, you know, first well, time it, offense? First time offense, you're, you're going to get probation. Uh, you're going to be uh, assigned to probation office. You're going to requir be required to get a chemical dependency evaluation mm -hmm. and then follow those recommendations, which as a general rule will uh, involve outpatient treatment. Mm -hmm. um, what happens is when people then uh, trip up down, down the road. Mm -hmm. So then you're getting a second offense, a third offense, a fourth offense, 
uh, and, and the penalties uh, tend to increase as you go. And what are the, what are the recidivism rates uh, from incarceration? You know, in term, if you have a drug problem and you're incarcerated, you're, you're let out again, what's the likelihood that you're going to just go right back into the system? You know, I don't have a number on that anymore, but it's, it's fairly high. I mean, incarceration is not really an effective way if, if there's not a, a treatment component if, and if the individual is not motivated. I mean, if they're sitting in jail uh, just waiting to get that next drink when they get out, then, that, that, then it's not effective at all. And, but drug courts... Drug courts are, are, are people are out in the community, they're required to get a job, they're required to follow the treatment recommendations, they're required, depends on the individual and the case, but they can be required to get parenting classes to get to, to participate in treatment. And if they don't, the judge has the authority to put them in jail for a couple of days. A couple of days in jail is a lot more effective than a couple of months, frankly. And, and Dr. Skewis? Um, yeah, absolutely. It's built on principles of operant conditioning, just rewards and punishments, right. you know, for, for behaving in a certain way, and, and it absolutely works. Now, one of the things that kept coming back as I was reading about, you know, the problem with drugs is that it sounds like there's fundamental underlying conditions that have to be addressed, which is if you're worried about drug use, if you're worried about people becoming addicted, you need to address things like poverty, education levels, uh, and on top of that, you need to basically deal with this notion of isolation. Let's go back to rural Montana, for example. Mm -hmm. You said that mental health care is hugely important. Mm -hmm. What's the likelihood someone in rural Montana can have access to a mental health provider? It's hard. I mean, I, I can't speak for all of rural Montana, but I know that it's really very difficult. And I think there's a large variability in the quality of care that people have access to. There's large wait lists. Um, there's, you know, here in Bozeman, if I go see a counselor and I don't fit with that person, I can just go see somebody else. Like, I don't know that you have that option in every community in Montana. There's also a lot of stigma around seeing a counselor or getting mental health care, where it might be a huge secret and you might be afraid to be seen going into the mental health or behavioral health center. And what's interesting, uh, Mr. Chief Justice, of course, a lot of this is about social isolation, too. And we have about 30 seconds or so left. Um, how much is this generally about people who have become, in, in strange respects, more centered on themselves and not parts of communities? I mean, in a way, even though we have the internet, we're more connected. In a lot of ways, we're just kind of more on our own islands as we, than we have in yeah, I, I'm probably not the person to answer that. I, I do think that what we see in terms of the people that are on those caseloads tend to be people that don't really have a lot of uh, hope. They don't really have a... Uh, they don't feel good about their place in society. They don't feel like they're going to be able to find meaningful work uh, or be able to really parent their kids. It's not that they don't want to parent their kids. It's just sometimes that they're unable. Well, this is certainly an issue that is going to have to be addressed by our leaders. Uh, we have you know, a gubernatorial campaign ongoing. Whoever becomes our next governor, whether that's Mr. Gianforte or whether that's Governor uh, Bullock, will have to basically step in and try to come up with solutions to try to address this issue and maybe it's a deal with poverty and isolation in these rural communities. So I want to thank you both for joining us on Face to State. Uh, next time we'll have a conversation about Initiative 181, the Montana Biomedical Authority that will be on the ballot for all us to consider and which will lead to more money uh, potentially being spent on medical research in Montana. This is David Parker for Face to State. Thanks for joining us. You've been watching Face to State, a presentation of MTN, the Montana Television Network.